And we're now doing something which is quite new uh, in the Moving Out of Academia events. We are going to have a show and share. So the show and share today is all about tips on preparing an industry ready CV and then alternatives. Um, we have somebody on the panel who claims to have never written a CV before, and we're going to find out how also that person has managed to um, apply and be successful in um, finding positions. So I'm going to hand over to Cecile, if that's OK. Um, we have uh, about 45 minutes to cover this um, part, and then we'll go into the networking breakout rooms. But I think this is going to be really informative. And please also don't hesitate to ask your questions in, in the chat, or we could invite you to come on on camera or in the Q&A tool. So Cecile, please take it away. So this presentation is about how to adapt your CV to the industry. Of course, if you want to move out of academia, you'll have some work to do on that. Um, and so we've put together like uh, some tips and practical examples on, uh, you know, how to help you to go through the process. Uh, I've had uh, very helpful external inputs to do this presentation. So thanks a lot to the people who contributed. And I hope the slides can be made available afterwards uh, because I'll try to keep it, you know, a bit simple in the presentation. And then at the end, we have like a bunch more slides with more tips. Um, so I wanted to start with like, you know, the main advice and takeaway message. I'm now on the recruiting side. So, you know, we're hiring people at our startup. So I've, I've seen, I've applied obviously when leaving academia and now I'm seeing the other side. And I think the main advice here that seems obvious, but uh, really is the most important is think about who will read your CV. Um, if you really do that, then the rest will come naturally, I think, um, because you know everything makes sense. So the person who reads your CV is probably not, most likely not from academia. If they are, that's great, right? But you can't really account for that. So you need to translate what you've done to something that you know they can understand. So translate your experience. We have already talked about you know, the vocabulary. So it's really important to use the right vocabulary for this. Also, really what they need to do is basically hire someone who would fit in our team and was the right uh, skill set, um, right? So they need to know basically at the end of reading your CV if you would be a good fit, if you would bring the expertise that they're looking for, uh, if, and if they would like to talk to you. So basically have an interview with you, and that's really the goal of your CV. So you basically need to explain cl clearly for them what you'd bring to the company um, and you know, what value you can add to the, to the team. Um, and the last advice, which also seems obvious, but uh, that's far from being always applied is adapt your CV to the position. So of course, we've already said, you know, data science can vary greatly from one position to, to uh, another one. You need to, really look at the job offer, really understand what they're looking for. Is it a very technical position or is it some position where you'll have an interface with a business team where you really need to be able to communicate? So you need to figure this out before you apply. If necessary, you can uh, you know, talk to people in, in the team, in the company to try and understand that so that your CV can really reflect what they're looking for. Again, is it very technical? Do you have uh, some some leadership in that position, or um, do you have some you know business aspects, and and for that you might need you know communication skills. So what you put forward in your CV depends on the position. Um, but yeah, let's go through uh, actually an example, and I took the example of my uh, CV when I left academia. So version one is basically this academic CV. Um, and you know that's just obviously part of it, but that's typically what you would have if you apply to research position, right? So you have like in my case, the last position, a postdoc in Atlas. Um, I'm not going to go through it all, but basically you list the analysis that you've done, 
So like a search in the top sector, study of properties of top pairs, whatever you lay, list the, you know, the data sets that you use, the final states, all of this. Um, then here's some more technical work, um, work on simulation, in this case for the high luminosity upgrades, some control shifts, uh, and then uh, some convener shifts. So we actually already discussed that a bit in the, in the Q&A. Um, of course, like that's something that you put in your academic CV, right? Uh, and then a list of papers, PhD students that you supervised and, and all of this. So in the end, you have a CV that's quite concise, but obviously very technical and nobody outside of particle physics can understand it, right? So the first step is to actually adapt that to, to something that other people can understand. So basically translate it. So that would be the, the version two would be the data science uh, CV. So you would explain what's a postdoc maybe uh, that, or you know, you could just say that you were a researcher for instance, and then um, there are some, of course, different categories like the experience that you had. Uh, so you can start with like the technical competencies. Obviously, if you're applying to data science, what's important is you cleaned, analyzed, and interpreted large data sets from, from you know, particle collision events from the LHC, for instance. Then if you've done other technical work on the upgrade or like you know, the detectors or anything else, that's also something that you could put in your CV. So again, if you want it to be very complete, like you know, you can you can put all of that. Um, then the second main category is scientific communication. Scientific communication is something that you know we do a lot in academia. We need to show results very regularly. We need to also show results outside of our collaboration. Um, so that's something that we're um, very trained on, and that's not something that necessarily very common in industry. And I think that's actually very valuable, like it brings a lot of skills, um, but you know, you need to show its level and, and impact. So for instance, instead of just a rough list of publication, like, you know, you publish that many articles in high impact journals and, and you know, as lead contributor, or you can state exactly what you've done on this. Um, you presented at international conferences, um, like national internal meetings, maybe say what the audiences typically were and, you know, how many you've done. That just shows, um, you know, how often you have to go through this exercise and what uh, the impact was. Um, and then, for instance, if you were in an editorial board, I think that's also something very valuable to put in, like, you know, all these reviewing aspects and, and uh, providing feedback on an analysis. Um, that's, again, that can translate into, into uh, something that's more business relevant. So that should also uh, be there. And then the, the final category could be like leadership and management. So have you supervised uh, PhD, uh, master students, summer students, um, what that means exactly. So for instance, structuring daily work, providing training, uh, problem solving. So that's the way you should kind of phrase these things um, because like, we know what supervising a PhD student mean, but you know, again, to the outside, it's not necessarily clear. If you have a convenership or any kind of responsibility in your collaboration, also explain what that means, right? So for instance, I, I translated the convenership as you know, um, supervised uh, research team by you know, reviewing the results, providing feedback, take guidance on the work, um, extend to whatever makes sense to you. Um, so at the end, you have all of these points. Um, I think it's more understandable already for someone who is, you know, not uh, from from particle physics, but it's very long. Uh, so we kind of need to restructure it in a way that's more catchy. Let's say that you know that's really where you're going to see the the right keywords at the right place, and also uh, select some of these experiences, again, depending on the job. So, you know, here, for instance, there were three points about scientific communication. If you, if it doesn't seem like it's needed in the job, maybe just keep one, for instance. Uh, if there is no leadership um, 
um, relevance, then maybe also select, you know, the one that makes sense. Like you don't have to put everything or you shouldn't put everything in your CV. Really try and select the things that have the most impact and that make uh, most sense. So then the next version would be really the CV that you sent. You summarize everything in a much more concise way. So for instance, like this, uh, again, you're applying for a data science job. So, you know, clean, analyzed, interpreted large data sets from the LHC. That can lead to, of course, many questions. And, and that's fine, right? Because these questions can then happen during an interview. And then you can go into details about what you did exactly, what were the challenges and so on. Uh, again, a few points about scientific communication. You published articles. Um, supervised, you know, research teams and so on. And then it's important to uh, to really explicitly say what your work uh, has brought to the, the collaboration. What were your achievements? And there were some. Sometimes it's difficult to phrase them, but I think it's important to do it. So for instance, uh, increase the speed of an algorithm by 80% or, you know, selected the signal in a background of, I don't know, a million to one, these kind of things. Um, it's, you know, for us, it seems obvious that it's part of the work, but again, for the outside, it's not necessarily. Um, and then summarize your technical expertise. So the programming languages, the machine learning te techniques, the data analysis tool, again, try to make it, you know, doesn't have to be, um, all of it, try to choose what's uh, looked for for that particular job. Um, and then if you do that, you basically at the end have a CV that a recruiter can read in 30 seconds or maybe one minute. And there is some tangible business relevance in, in what you've put in there. So they, they know what you're capable of doing and then they can already imagine what you could do for their team. So that's really the, the, the important thing here. And you have a guideline for hopefully a future discussion, which would then be an interview uh, where you could you know, then go into more details in what does it mean, you know, interpret large data sets or you know, supervise group of research teams and, and so on. Um, yeah. Of course, you might add more um, categories to that CV. Obviously, you could have like an introduction, for instance, at the top. I think it's uh, is something nice to do because it kind of gives you the opportunity to really put emphasis on the things that you really want to put forward. So you're a data scientist first and, and a former particle physicist, for instance. That's how I phrase it. But you know, you can choose different, a different way of putting it. Um, what is your goal? What motivates you? Like all of these, these values that you know companies are also looking for. Um, you could add a list of certification or courses. So for instance, if you are quite far away from the field that you're applying to, showing that you already looked into it, that you already got trained on it, shows really a motivation and, and makes the picture complete. It shows that you know you just didn't decide from one day to the next to move to data science. That it's a, a process, and you already started. So you took some steps towards that direction. Um, you could add like a table-like summary of skills, uh, just to make it again very concise and and easy to uh, to understand. Uh, and also, what's very uh, important that we discussed several times. Um, a link to external resources. So for instance, your networks, um, LinkedIn or alumni.cern. Of course, it's nice if you know recruiter want to know a bit more, they could check these networks and then see that your profile again is, is makes sense like overall for them and you know compare to your CV. Uh, of course, you can link to uh, your papers, your inspire profile, your thesis, like anything that you want to, to promote basically, and also the code. So GitHub typically we've already um, discussed. Just checking on the time. Um, 
So now I would like to finish with a few key tips that maybe go a bit away from, from the CV. So the first one is, well, still to the CV, like ask someone outside of CERN to review it. Like, does it make sense for them? Do they understand what you mean? If not, then obviously you need to work more on it. And that's fine, right? Like that's an iterative process. You don't get there on the first trial. Um, another tip from me would be to uh, really if you really like a position and you know you think you would be a good fit like call the person uh, from the company that you apply to like usually you have like a contact write to them call them maybe before even applying so that you can understand what uh, exactly they're looking for like um, what the process is like the timeline and so on and i think it makes a big difference to follow up on your application and um, practice makes perfect, uh, so you will have to go through a lot of iterations uh, on, on the CV to find, you know, the, the right one that really makes sense. Uh, so don't get discouraged, it, you know, it takes, it takes practice. Um, and it will take a lot of applications to get your dream job, so that is also something that you should be prepared for. Uh, it is common to send, you know, hundreds applications or even more. It seems a lot and it seems like, you know, you, you can't do it. But really, if you send one application in the morning and then one application in the afternoon and you will have to do that for some time anyway, like a few weeks, then you'll get to the hundred application. And in the end, it's actually not such a big deal. Like you, you know, it's, it's manageable. It's definitely manageable. You need just need to be prepared that it's going to take a while and it's going to take some efforts. But I also think the mindset is extremely important there. Uh, if you see this as an opportunity to see what's out there, you really, actually, you might enjoy the process. Uh, I think it's actually very interesting. You learn about many companies, you get to talk to many different people, you see what's you know out of um, the academia world, and that's actually really cool. So, and I think you also do it completely differently if you are happy to do it. Uh, it seems again a lot of work and a lot of effort at first, but it's it's worth it. Uh, and then the final one, which I think is the most important, talk to your network, talk to people, let them know that you're looking for a job because usually, in most cases, that's how you actually get a position. It's by you know a contact of a contact. Um, it's again, like, don't be shy. If you're shy, then it's a lot of effort. But again, I think it's worth it. And use the networks like university, CERN alumni, the connections on LinkedIn, even if it's not direct, like just go and talk to people. Uh, and it might, you know, be very um, important in the end. Um, so there is a bunch of more tips that we summarized in, in uh, the, the other slides, but I think, I don't know, uh, maybe we should already move on to questions, I guess. Thank you, Cecile. That was uh, worth its weight. And I can't say it's worth its weight in gold because I know it doesn't weigh anything, but that was really, really very, um, very insightful. Thank you very much. My, my kind of approach has been, um, let's say, last five years or so, five years or so, I, I was so active in LinkedIn, uh, build, you know, building my network. So I think I, today I have something like 2,200 contacts and followers, a little bit more. Um, and, um, and, and, and it, LinkedIn started to work for me so well that um, um, I think I have not updated my, let's say the classic CV resume for four years now. So what I'm doing, what I'm doing these days is I'm uh, I'm updating my LinkedIn profile, and and there is an opportunity to just to print print that LinkedIn profile as a uh, CV. So um, so that's what I would like to talk in my 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 presentation. Um, um, the, the critical thing is that you you are um, I would say you are um, actively uh, participating that social network that you have chosen. So so be active. You know, like follow people, like the post, 
I think where the world is going on is you need to more and more contribute yourself. So I think it's probably quite critical that you really demonstrate and share something interesting. You, you, you demonstrate your skills, you share, you know, interesting posts, what is happening in, in your, your line of work and, hey guys, look at this, what we have done. Um, uh, you you like and you get uh, endorsed by colleagues, so you exist. So in that digital world, you you are existing first time. If you are not doing this, you are not in a way existing in uh, in the digital world in that sense. Um, so that's my point of view. Um, I have noticed that uh, uh, things are changing really rapidly. Um, you know, half a year, one year, uh, very likely you need to update your, your, your profile. You know, what kind of training you have done, what, what are, you know, the words, what is, the, what is really happening, what is the discussion topics today. So it means continuous uh, participants, conti continuous rebranding to say, so your kind of uh, the professional identity. If you really are a data scientist, you know what is happening right now in, in the business. Um, my, my second point is this, um, uh, the, um, the LinkedIn works, there are other platforms as well. LinkedIn works pretty well on, uh, uh, on, on the kind of uh, helping you to apply. So now assume you have that, assume that you have up-to-date profile what you can do here is an example. So what I did, I, I just, uh, I was looking, I, I said, you see the specification. I was looking, what are the uh, European Union data scientist roles and ex high experience level and uh, uh, all the job postings that last week. And what I got, I think I got six plus 600 and different countries. And many of these, many of these increasingly this, this, you can apply, just click that icon there. That's it, your, your daily quarter on applying job is, is done. So it can be as easy as that. Um, and I, I, if I have to predict, things are changing really quickly to this direction. Kind of manual, you know, manual uh, CV, um, I, I think if you do it properly, if you keep updated your profile, it can be, just think about it, it can be generated. And the application process in a similar manner can be, can be automated to certain degrees. Um, you know, a lot of startup companies doing this, as you know. Uh, my, my final point today is the headhunters. So now, you can maybe guess what happened after I had a lot of, lot of contacts, a lot of activity. I went there daily. I, I put myself out there, so to say. You know what happened then? I didn't need to apply. HR and headhunters started to contact me. So uh, this is where I'm standing today. Uh, a lot of interesting roles are being proposed to me instead of me working really hard trying to find new opportunities. So headhunters, interestingly, they well, how do they earn the money? They typically earn one, two, three months worth of the role, the salary. So depending on, uh, I would say, depending on the, the, the skill level, the headhunters are, are earning a lot of, lot of money particularly the more senior role, the more headhunters are active in the field. So, so my thinking is this, you guys, when, when, when you, if, if you make a transition from academia to uh, industry, the more senior your role is in, 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 the, in, 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 in industry, the more likely you will meet and you get value from headhunters. So you don't have to pay them, they give, they, they give you uh, guidance, they, uh, you can think of them even as being a, something like an agent, you know, in, in, um, in uh, entertainment industry. It's this classic, classic approach where agent handles your, let's say, business. And I, 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 I have a feeling that many of the, the headhunters I've been working with, they honestly, really honestly want to know you. They want to find out what is your passion 
and then they will go out there and find a role of your lifetime. That's it. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Atos. Again, another viewpoint, uh, great tips that you've given us. I um, can only reiterate what you've both said. In fact, what many of you have said also, don't forget that you've got the alumni.cern platform and you can see today, all of our um, panelists are testimony to the fact that they are there, um, willing to share their, their tips and their guidance with you. So please don't forget to um, connect to the platform if you haven't done so yet. Keep your profiles up to date because that will enhance your networking experience. And then don't hesitate to, to reach out to the alumni that have joined. If there's alumni working in companies you're interested in or sectors you're interested in, contact them. Don't, um, don't be shy. Um, Cecil and uh, Atos already said it, but just to stress, I think it's really important to do also the networking part. There are really no excuses. So if you have to invest time, invest it in, in there. And also an option that was not uh, mentioned, but sometimes it's available with companies, it's internal uh, referrals from employees of the company. So if you have connections in the company, just ask if they have this uh, program available. Because also for HR, sometimes it's very costly to find for the right person, to understand the profiles, go through that process. Um, it's much easier if you know a person working there, they can sponsor you. Thank you, Federica. One thing also I'd like to mention is for those who don't know, we regularly organize the alumni network um, events called virtual company showrooms. So these are companies that advertise their opportunities on the CERN alumni platform who talk for 30 minutes about their company and the types of profiles they're looking to recruit. And then you have 30 minutes where you can talk to the talent acquisition HR team and find out more about the position. So it's quite a, an informal way to make that first connection with companies that are actively trying to recruit from within the CERN alumni talent pool. Okay, I think there's no more hands, so I can hand over to Jason. And then we'll get cracking with the Q&A. Yeah, it's um, a quick one slide from me, um, largely around the point on the right hand side, just to remember uh, recruitment affairs and job fairs. And a great example is the Silicon Milk Roundabout in London, of which the next one is in May. And uh, the second day is devoted to developers and data science, for example. So if you can find something local to you like that, it's a very great way of having a lot of conversations, looking at a lot of different kinds of working styles and getting your CV in hands at the same time as having face-to-face -face chat. So your CV can actually rise up the pile a bit there. Um, and the only other thing I've emphasized from this slide is events. Um, Pi Data have chapters all over the world. They're really, really great meetups to go and see people who are passionate about Python and applying it to data problems, and you'll hear about what they're doing in their respective jobs. Um, organizations like the Royal Statistical Society have explicit data science threads. Um, the Alan Turing Institute is the UK's equivalent of what Roberto, uh, Roberto Swiss Data Science Center. If you look for events um, with those organizations as well, um, it's a chance for networking and it's a chance to get a feeling for how the field is developing. That's all. Thank you very much, Jason. Thanks to all of you who took part in this uh, chunk of the, of the event. I so think I'll go through the, through the first questions that it is still related to job search, but it is at least a, a bit related to the training to get out there and to, to really be uh, well prepared. Is, is about certifications. What kind of certifications are recognized in this area? Course, Coursera courses, are these useful in job hunting? If one really wants to do some training, is there some really a standard recognized one that you would advise? Federica. Yeah, I can ask this one. Um, so it depends on the topic, of course, but uh, I think it's worth to have a look at uh, uh, obvious common things that are used in the industry. For example, uh, Tableau training. There are many valuable trainings uh, available. There's also a free version that you can try for a few days on your computer. So uh, do it. Even if you don't have an official certification, but still you can uh, say, I use it in a hobby project or in a course. This is already better than uh, nothing. And other things are uh, SQL courses. Like there are many available also on uh, Coursera or on other platforms, uh, Udemy and so on. 
And the third one would be uh, project management. So if you're going in the direction to uh, working on projects and uh, coordinating work and so on, uh, check maybe uh, also the agile uh, uh, development, for example, certifications like uh, a professional scrum master, professional scrum, um, scrum product owner. Uh, you pay a little bit for the certification, but I think it pays off. To do it. Uh. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So def definitely three areas, Tableau, all the Coursera Udemy that you acknowledge it can be uh, interesting, and then a bit of agile project management. Jason? Yeah, I think uh, similarly, um, there isn't really a gold standard because there's lots of things out there, but um, repeating what's already been said, there are some great Coursera specializations. Um, I would look, uh, this is personal taste, but I would look favorably on any leaning towards um, being interested in including the engineering side. I'm coming back to the same theme again. It's really important about the integration with um, productionization. And there are now courses um, emergent now um, expressly around that. Um, the other style is um, uh, cloud platform courses. So the main three, of course, are AWS, Azure, and Google Cloud. So something like the Microsoft Data Science Certification is um, relatively um, quick to do, um, and that would demonstrate a sort of cloud way of working. Um, so there's no right answer, but it, it helps, I think. Okay, very good, very useful. Atos, you want to add something? Well, Jason, Jason already mentioned um, if I had to pick one, that would be the cloud certification. You should get that one, uh, but particularly if you are um, if you're a data engineer, um, it gives immediate sort of proof that you're capable of starting work in you know, day one. So with certificate, you can be a data data engineer pretty much day day one. So um, okay, very good advice. Moving on to another question, and, and I link it with the comments. We said that it is important to know what one wants, uh, to know yourself, to understand what is your target. What are the differences, the benefits, disadvantage in terms of ambient salary, entry point of a startup or, of, or a small company compared to a, ver to a large uh, corporate? Uh, we have, I think, examples here of both. Those of you who chose one or the other, was it randomly? You know what you were targeting, Vessel, you are nodding. What do you think? Yes, I'm nodding. So about salaries, I mean, we all live in the, we have the idea that in academia, salaries are okay from to make a living, but you won't get rich. If you want to get rich, you need to go to industry. This does, this does however, not mean that if you move from academia to industry, you will immediately, uh, should immediately expect a huge salary bump. That's just, uh, you're, you're set for a disappointment then. Um, I think if you can preserve your same salary, that's already a good target to aim at. Um, however, uh, you negotiate your salary if you get a job offer. So you just really need to study the market well and do the negotiation well. Okay, very useful points on salary expectations. Uh, who else, uh, Jason? Yeah, on a sort of, oops, um, on a sort of related point, um, I mean, there, there are um, a lot of data science opportunities in the public sector, and there will obviously be a tendency for lower salary there. But there is a, a, a choice that can be made about what you're what you're doing and, and uh, your decision around the salary. But there's lots of opportunity um, in all aspects of the public sector. Mm. Federica? Yeah, um, so what I can add, um, if you go for a big uh, organization, that was a bit my personal uh, experience in uh, all the positions. Um, I think you must be aware that they are they come with their own structure, right? So you must be aware of the processes they have. So how many business units, how they communicate, how they work together and so on. So this is adding some complexity but also is an advantage because you can always reach out to other people that have all the skills that are needed. So having this big network uh, could be a pro in this case. 
Uh, and then uh, second point is, I think, uh, what you should evaluate during the job interview is also the level of maturity of the company you go to. So what kind of data scientists are they looking for? Uh, what do they expect from you? Because uh, still, uh, it's uh, not clear, not all the time, what people uh, think that a data scientist or a data engineer should be doing. Mm. It's a point that has been uh, coming repeatedly during uh, this time we have been talking. So it's a very important to, point to take home. Uh, Atos. Um, I, I have always, uh, during my data science career, I have always done a pro bono work now and then. So small free project advice, advising uh, companies, uh, mentoring. Um, I have found that from that you you get great, you know, it's a great fun. Uh, you can say that you you know this case, you know this business as well, and it is great man monetary value when when you are you know discussing the salary. So build your experience base through wonderful, exciting cases. For example, startup companies provide a great opportunity to just go there and, you know, let's see if I can help you. So it's a zero euros uh, payment, but actually it really builds up your, it can really build up your profile. Yes, I think especially in the first time one gets into a different field uh, is the experience, is the soft skills you will get uh, uh, by doing the job. So there are many points to consider. Looking and the network as well, sorry to interrupt, yeah. you build your network as well. Which the is network, crazy. and it, this is very important for the next steps uh, for moving on, for reaching out. Yeah, yeah, certainly, which is partly also what we are doing here today which is very important. So also continuing um, on this, comparing the different fields, the different type of companies, small, big startup. There is, there is a question on, on how is the climate, uh, how, how is the ambience, I would say, uh, compared to the, the academic uh, world. The question says for women, but I would say in, te in terms of diversity, in terms of different nationalities, gender, age uh, how what is your experience did you see a change uh, vessel that's a question that's close to my heart because one of the reasons i was done with physics is that i wanted to see other people than white men and um but it's the grass on the other side the industry it's different but not better or worse you can find industries that are absolutely terrible and you can find organizations that are fantastic so my recommendation is be critical about where you apply. Yes, if it is an important criteria for you, it's something to be yeah. checked uh, while you are in the process of deciding where you want to go. Atos. Yeah, so um, I've, um, we, earlier we discussed the soft skills. Actually, I would, I would, I would um, my hypothesis and some, I have some evidence for this is that uh, if you are if you're a woman, uh, you might have uh, edge against white guys that have trouble communicating. <laughs> they're <laughs> they're very smart AI algorithms. So um, um, in in data science, in data engineering, it it is absolutely critical to be uh, to to have a have uh, soft skills, absolutely. So it, it, it in a in a way allows women to uh, thrive in 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 all kind of organizations. Um, that's my understanding. I also would like to say that um, my 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 experience from these biggest companies, biggest companies, very large corporations. Interestingly, it boil it seems to boil down to the fact that. Because this is a, such, such a transformative thing, you know, digital revolution. It 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 is often the the people people like you when you are hired there, you actually end up being uh, kind of advertising something very new for the big uh, big big uh, corporation. So it's a skunk works in a way. So your unit is small typically. And you are spreading this this new uh, 
new information about being data-driven uh, advanced analytics. So interestingly, my, to my experience, because the technology and the whole field is such, such a new and evolving, you often end up working in a teams that are very startup-like. So this is, this is my understanding. So be ready to do everything. <laughs> yes. Atos, you said that, that uh, this is a, a field, uh, data engineering, where one would need soft skills. I would understand that, that in general, going to business and to private companies, as you need to be in contact with uh, marketing, with business analysts, with sales, you need some soft skills. Why specifically in data engineering? Is there another angle why you specifically need these soft skills? Well, um... Well, I, I, I think the, the, because the, 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 the data that you are, you are analyzing, data you are, you know, you're building pipelines, you are validating, you you know, filtering data. It's, uh, it's so often it's about human, human activity. You know, do I like this? <laughs> you know, you are counting thumbs up, trends, uh, trendy words. If, if customer likes or hates the service, it's very human. It's very human. The, all the data that you are processing, you need to really, truly understand what is happening there. What is behind? Yeah, exactly. Okay. And 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 also, I, I let's say my my somehow my assumption when when I moved from academia to industry, I, I had some sort of assumption that it is. You know, this quite I had this quite theoretical background, and you know, let's automate this. <laughs> I would fully automate things. You don't automate things at the deep level. Everything what we do is deeply human, deeply, deeply human, and it makes sense only in the, the business world. That it's about human, what people like, what people don't like, and yes. as, as we have learned the last few weeks. Things change dramatically, and then you need to reconsider, readjust your your worldview, and it's still about human um, interaction. Yeah, human. Okay. Yeah, it never it never goes away, and 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 the best data engineers understand what the data talks. Yeah, and, and they go always, one step ahead uh, and can yes, uh, yes. understand and that. Always, uh, mm, okay. Yeah. And, Exactly, and, and I want to close my, my statement with the, the saying that I've never seen any da data engineer to work in isolation, never, ever. That's it's a very, as, very important yes. and a yes. very strong point uh, yes. also always, for today. Always as part of team where we have data scientists working with data engineer, typically there are business owners you know, and there are sales guys. And then you even even interact often with the actual client, the actual end user, you know. So 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 that's 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 how I see it. Okay, thank you, Atos. And we still have, uh, I think, Federica waiting to comment on these very interesting questions. I'll what be very you short. Yeah, and uh, no, just wanted to add, um, I think soft skills are crucial also because in uh, data science and data engineering, it's very easy to be tricked by the data. So if you're not an expert and you see a plot of something, it's very easy to forget some of the assumptions behind or to not interpret it correctly. And that's why you need a, a technical people that must be able to communicate with the business people. So if you don't convince your uh, product owner, your product manager, or why something is right or wrong, and what are the assumptions, then this is not going in the right direction. So that's very, very important. Yeah, because one has to have in mind that all this big data, all this analysis is done to take business decisions in the business world. And business decisions are, are taken by the business manager. So all this communication is a very important point. Not only to be very technical in analyzing the data, but be able to transfer what it means. Jason, yeah. we'll finish with you. Thank you, yeah. Um, there's a crucial theme in machine learning, which is that building good machine learning models uh, can only be done with diverse teams. Um, and so actually, it's a, I think it's an increasing trend that expressly the teams being built 
are built for diversity by whatever label or aspect. By design. Mm. Um, so that, that's one remark. Um, the other one which hasn't come up actually, um, which people should be aware of, is um, some of the how different different sectors can be. So retail, um, automotive, the energy sector, uh, whatever, um, uh, health, public sector, they, they face, um, each faces its own set of unique problems and, and unique transformation problems. And it's quite interesting just to think about that through, uh, through, through that lens and, and, and how you're um, sort of playing into that. Yes. Fully agree. Very important point. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Jason. I think with this, we make it to the end of the questions in this big uh, Zoom room with everybody. I handle to Rachel, which I think will tell us the next steps. Absolutely. So uh, I just before we go on to the next steps, I wanted to say a very big thank you to you, Maite, for doing such a wonderful job in moderating the event today. We're really very grateful. So thank you very much for that. And then also thanks, many, many, many thanks to our panelists who have shown us some really insightful things about data science and data engineering. And they've very kindly agreed to, to stay on. It's been a long afternoon uh, and join us in their own breakout rooms. So many, many thanks to everybody today. It's been a fantastic event and um, we look forward to seeing you soon at another alumni event. Thank you.